No, um, <laughs> that's where I have to start the video, which I didn't do for the second segment of this lecture. So while you guys are going home, I'll be here taping. So um, I think I'll be able to get through it fairly quickly. Either that or I'll do it next week, okay? So on record, I forgot to tape that second segment, which is such a bummer, but that's okay. Okay, so I'll either have it done for you tonight or, you know what's a real bummer is when I think I've done like an okay job doing it and then it's done on tape, I'm like, oh, <laughs> really? So, okay. So, now we're going to be talking about a few more, and I think a lot of this we've kind of gone through, and I would like to get through this chapter before the end of today. Okay, so phagocytosis is going to be those little macrophages. In fact, phagocytosis really can happen with other white blood cells as well. And what it is, is that cell comes to whatever the antigen is and engulfs it, okay? And when it engulfs it, it brings it in, it walls it off, and then it dumps enzymes into that walled off section to eat up whatever that substance is, virus, bacteria, parasite if it's you know small enough that it can take care of it, okay? So phagocytosis will do that, okay? So chemo, you know, chemotaxis, subsonization will happen, draws them to that area, eats up those substances, okay? And we've kind of already talked about this. That's why I'm sort of, does that make sense? Yes? Okay. <clears throat> so exotoxins will be substances that come from the external environment that they will take care of. Macrophages, as we talked about, can also clear up debris, okay? So your body's constantly building up and breaking down. It could come in and it's kind of the little trash man. It'll eat up those substances. So what can happen, obviously, I think this is pretty obvious, if blood vessels are too hard or not pliable, if you don't have enough food to make your white blood cells, okay, if you have leukemia, which doesn't allow white blood cells to mature or grow normally, those white blood cells will not be as prevalent and you will get more what? Infections, okay? So mediation of inflammation. Um, so there are cellular mediators, there are plasma-derived mediators. We're going to talk about this more in the future, okay, when we talk about um, immunity unto itself. So the thing to remember, though, is that inflammation should be at appropriate levels. Where am I going with this? Where am I going with this? It's shock, absolutely, right? If somebody goes into anaphylactic shock because, you know, they are allergic to bees, we talked about that earlier, they eat peanuts, right? There's too much inflammation. You're going to have fluid leave the bloodstream and they can go into shock. Very good. Okay? And it's right there, isn't it? Okay, so hypovolemia in the bloodstream. Um, if there's a constant level of chronic inflammation, such as RA, well, the, the other thing, let me just read through the rest of this. Too little on that. Okay, so a couple things to talk about with inflammation. If we don't have an appropriate immune response, we will get sick more often. Okay, for example, on AIDS, we talked about that. But what's happening with RA? R a rheumatoid, rheumatoid arthritis. And true rheumatoid, you know, do, do you have older patients who, especially if you're in a more rural area, what do they call regular osteoarthritis? They call it rheumatoid, rheumatism, right? So this is not osteoarthritis. I'm talking about rheumatoid, okay? What is rheumatoid? No. Yes, autoimmune. Okay, so this is inflammation gone wild. This is the body not recognizing its own tissues as itself. This can cause a couple different disease processes, but in RA, what does the immune system like to attack? The joint. The joint. So primarily, I believe there's some endocardial kind of effects as well, right? <clears throat> Thank you, mitral, mitral valve prolapse, etc. But 
it likes to attack the joints, and they get that kind. And we'll get into that. That's an old, old topic. And the ulnar deviation of the hands. You know, the joints can actually fuse over a prolonged period of time if you take a picture of those joints. Okay, so that is the immune system. For some reason, do we know why? Do we know why? Do we know why this autoimmune response happens? Yes, it does, but why? Is it genetic? Is it, we don't, I, my point is we don't, oh, no. <laughs> we don't know, right? We don't know. We'd be millionaires if we could find out, wouldn't we, right? Okay, so for some reason your body doesn't recognize that tissue as its own. Okay, so there's got to be appropriate levels of inflammation. So signs of anaphylactis pr seems pretty familiar, right? Doesn't the swollen lips and the swollen airway make more sense now, right? Because it's going to be fluid pushing out into those tissues. Okay, the rash, like, you know, I was kind of going through, because I was thinking about some of the common signs and symptoms of anaphylactic, other than, you know, the visual ones, is nausea, diarrhea, vomiting, right? Well, I'm trying to figure out on a physiological basis why. And I was really looking it up last night, and it's kind of... anything to do with, like, because how you were talking about Of We're having a suggestion about the shunting of fluids. Like it's going to go to your vital organs and. It here. could be. There's there was a few things that I noted online about the increase in peristalsis, which make remember peristalsis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Right. Okay. Oh yeah. Do you, right when you say oh yeah, is that like a bad? No, oh, because I. You do, do okay. Actually. You do okay. Periostalsis, you know, would cause it vomiting and that diarrhea. The serotonin can also be released by mast cells, and I know serotonin is strongly affiliated with the GI tract. I don't know. Did you? Well, I think the anaphylaxis is every time it gets exposed, um, an antigen is exposed, um, it gets it gets it more and more and more and more of a like I had a bee sting on a patient. And the patient, um, the first time around, did okay. And the Can you turn on your microphone? I'm sorry. I'm trying just, to get used to this system. Just hit the button. Yep. And it should turn red. But the key to the first sting is is they're going to probably live through it. The, the right. patient education part comes in when you have to tell them that for the rest of their life, they're going to need to carry they an EpiPen. Up, sure and have an EpiPen available, and then you have to write the script, and then you have to make sure it can get on the airplane, and then you have to, you know, it's a sure. big long thing because every time they get stung, their system becomes less and less able to manage because the antigen's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. They just can't, they can't. So I wonder if it's, if the antigen, I'm trying to think of it on a real physiological basis though. Like is the antigen being exposed to the midbrain and that's causing vomiting? I don't, because oh. you understand, see what I'm saying? Like, I'm trying to get to the, totally get that clinical part. Like, what is it that creates the vomiting? What is it that creates the diarrhea? Is there a neurological? I'm not asking for an answer, because I don't know the answer. I was just sort of throwing it out there. There could anybody. be, because there are other things that cause nausea, like when the cervix dilates to a certain sure. point. You God, know, what a horrible, there's I think it back to when I birthed it. Yeah. There's receptors and it's, and you know you could even have that Sorry. when you uh, even have an exam. Sure. You know, so so some dilatation of this of that mucous membrane does cause uh, stimulation of uh, sympathetics. Stimulation. Yeah. Hmm. And it's not something that I'm just throwing it out there if anybody you know thinks of a great little. No. You know, talking about the anaphylactic. Now my husband was a, had an anaphylactic reaction to bee stings, but then he. Uh, had allergy injections. Can you turn that mic off, by the way? He had Thanks. allergy injections, which over a year, uh -huh. apparently, you know, reversed. So we're talking that. about allergy injections. You're talking about a helping anaphylaxis. Are you saying reverse that? Mm -hmm. So at some point, maybe you know, you're 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 given very minute portions of yeah. what a bee sting would be. Right. In, in it so that your body does not overreact. Exactly. Right. But 
it, I don't know how it conditions. And that's what it does, because it creates a small amount of uh, antibodies that your body will become so more and more. What? Yeah, because he's been bitten since then, and he hasn't had any reaction. Isn't that interesting? But he yeah, had. I've had never a, heard that with bee stings. Never heard that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Bee he, he, went, he, he went to yeah. a dermatologist. Yeah. Well, he was a hunter, and he went into severe oh, depression. Oh, that's a bad combo. Thinking, yeah, oh my goodness. I said, well, we'll just go get allergy sure. shots. We went to the dermatologist, and they. That's yeah. interesting. They tested and found out exactly what venom he was allergic to, <coughs> and they over a period of a year. Our oh. insurance paid for it. Well, get, yeah, get the info. Okay, so signs of anaphylaxis. Okay, so we're, we're going to kind of zip through this, right, because we've kind of touched upon this. So mast cells, basophil derivative, we've talked about this. It's going to release histamine. Histamine is a potent what? Vasodilator. Okay, it's going to open things up. It also will make those vessels more permeable. Eicosanoids are going to be substances from, we haven't talked about this, from cell membranes, Okay. Have we heard of COX-2 and COX-1 inhibitors or COX inhibitors, okay? What do they do? They decrease inflammation, okay? This is where I'm going with this, okay? Eicosanoids are substances which will start the inflammatory process. So they're substances that are released from cell membranes, they're called cytokines, and they will be uh, transferred or transformed into substances which will promote inflammation. Okay, so that's where we're going with this. Okay, they can also release, so they can release what are called leukotrienes, which are going to be their own separate little division. Does anybody know where we see leukotrienes in response to allergens? Well, we could see them anywhere. Does anybody know where they're most, I actually have this, leukotrienes. Leukotrienes are going to be strongly affiliated with asthmatics. Leukotrienes are going to cause vaso, or I'm sorry, bronchioconstriction. Okay, because one of the medications, this is one of the few medicinal things that sticks in my head because I get treated for it. Singular. Okay, what do they tell people with singular to take? To take it at night because it decreases those leukotrienes. <laughs> okay, to help that response. Okay, so prostaglandins are going to be one of those eicosanoids as well. Okay, so the eicosanoids are going to form what are called arachidonic acid. I'll show you a picture in just a minute. Okay, and then they could form all these different substrates. So leukotriene, prostaglandins, and thromboxanes. I don't think I put in there, but we'll get into that in the future. Okay, so don't worry about that for now. Prostaglandins are going to be a big, big substance that's released in the body that will promote inflammation. Okay. So all of these come from this derivative that comes from the cell membrane. Now, it, let me just make a little side note, and then I want to jump ahead a little bit. Nitric oxide is a potent vasodilator from macrophages. Okay, so this is another substance that will, so what are we doing? We're just like double, triple, quadruple whammy when it comes to inflammation to make sure that things are going to keep going until things get fixed. Okay, so nitric oxide. We also see, isn't nitric oxide what they use for... Dental procedures? Well, I was thinking of something else to help you remember. It's a phasodilator. This is the little purple pill, little blue pill. What is it? Oh, yeah? Really? Yeah. Okay, that's pretty. <laughs> I have people who would disagree with you. <laughs> but, okay, and we'll keep that off tape. Okay, so corticosteroids, and I'll show you a picture in just a second, are going to shut up the inflammatory process very high up. So when we look at, okay, <clears throat> when we look at this transformation, so eicosanoids are going to be these substances which come from the cell membrane. They start off as arachidonic acid. Sorry to get into biochemistry, but, okay, arachidonic acid is going to come from the cell membranes. It actually forms two pathways. I left one off because I want to focus on this one, okay? If you give somebody a steroid, because isn't like a steroid kind of like a, we don't know what to do, let's give them a steroid, right, okay? Because, I don't, I don't know, it, but thank God we have it, right? I mean, so this is where steroids work. Stops it all right here. Stops inflammation, okay? At Stops the beginning, that swelling. At the beginning of the cascade? Right event? here. Okay. Yep, okay? Right here. Okay. 
when we get into anti-inflammatories, and that's why corticosteroids like shut everything down, okay? Because it doesn't let it get from beyond that cell membrane. Are you with me? It keeps it in that primitive form. If it didn't, they would progress down to form inflammation, pain, fever, you know, all these things that are listed. Are you with me? Okay. In general, like NSAIDs, okay, aspirin, okay, is going to work here. Okay, it's going to work here. And the pathway that actually doesn't cover is leukotrienes, but I'm not going to get much into that, but for those of you who are wondering, that's what happens, okay. Because yeah, I so, was looking at my book and yes, I was wondering why you weren't talking about it because it seems so important. I can if you want me to. I'm really hoping, I'm trying to pare it down to, I'm hoping stuff. But if there's other things that you want to go over, I would be happy to. She's like, no. Okay. All right, good. So this is where these guys work. Now, what happened with those COX-2 inhibitors? They worked here which is great because what did they not affect? They didn't affect the GI mucosa, right? They didn't affect actually the um, perfusion of the kidneys, okay? But what started to happen with the COX-2, they started to throw clots, right? And there was a cardiovascular response. So we're not there yet, but I know that people are working on that. Because what happens with aspirin and what happens with ibuprofen is that it's damaging to the GI mucosa and also to the duodenum. Okay, do you remember where the duodenum is? Okay. Okay, so does that kind of clarify those COX inhibitors? Okay, yeah. right? <laughs> She's like, God. Okay, so I have a funny. <laughs> okay, don't sue me and don't turn me in. I told my mother I was supposed to go visit my parents. We we're going to leave tonight and go see them. And I said, Mom, I'm really sorry. Because my parents are not old by any means, but they're in their 60s. So they're getting to that age where their immune system is not. My two kids had the Coxsackie virus. And I called my mom. And I could feel my throat was getting inflamed. I'm like, Mom, I'm really sorry. I think I have Coxsackie virus. <laughs> she goes, I'm really sorry that you have Coxsackie. I was like, no, 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 it's hand, foot, mouth disease, mom. So anyway, that's my mom for you. God bless her. So don't turn me in. I never, ever tell off stories, off color stories. Sorry. Okay. So that's what happens along these pathways, okay, and where those, those medications interfere. All right. So moving back up. Okay. Let's try to get through this. So I think I got through all of that. So now plasma-derived mediators, so we've talked about cells, right? Primarily those cellular reactions. There's going to be some plasma-derived mediators. This is kind of a general going over the different types, okay? So coagulation is going to do what? Coagulate the blood, right? Fibrolinic is going to create the promotion of those fibers that we talked about before. Complement cascade. This is going to be proteins that will be found in the blood that will start to stimulate that immune response, okay? Kinins regulate, kinins, the primary thing that I want you to know about kinin is it'll produce bradykinin. Bradykinin is find, found quite commonly with pain responses, okay? One of the biochemicals that can increase pain, okay? So bradykinin, okay? So I'm kind of buzzing through this, but this is just sort of a general introduction. Any questions about this? No? Okay. Okay, so we went through this. Any questions about this one either? No? Okay, good. So, systemic effects of acute inflammation. So, it's, does this all seem pretty familiar? Are you guys familiar with most of this, right? Lymphadenitis, lymphangitis. What is going to be the difference? What's the difference between those? I had to look at that for a little while. Uh -uh. Yes, one's in the node and one is in the, yes. the vessel. Very good. So ange refers to vessel. What, what does? A ange, A-N-G. Oh. Lymphangitis. Yeah, I really had to sit and look at that for a while. Okay, so lymphangitis, okay. Do you feel that? Like you feel nose? Oh, you will? Okay. Yeah. Figure, yeah. And you could, well, I have a picture, okay, that we'll look at. And then before I get off track, again, adenal generally refers to glandular tissue, okay? So in those lymph vessels, we don't have that lymphatic tissue. 
Okay, but in the lymph nodes, we do. So lymphadenitis, lymphangitis, bacteria, you may have read, it's going to be bacteria in the blood. Okay, and lymphatasis, lympho, lymphocytosis, <laughs> I'm sorry, leukocytosis, you can tell I'm getting tired. This is a long time to lecture. It's going to be an increase in white blood cells, and I talked to you about all those different types of increases and what they can mean. Okay. Laura, my late lady. Thank you. Okay, so what do we have here? Red streak. That's the vessel one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. Is that obvious? Yeah. Well, yeah. Oh. Yeah. As opposed to. Lymphedema. Yeah. Now that's pronounced, right? Okay. If we have um, swelling in lymph nodes, we've all felt that, right? Okay. It could be generally pea size. I mean, it could be larger. This is excessive. I put this up so you could see that. Okay, you could see that great example. You could see that yeah. and pronounced swelling in lymph lymphoma. Right. right. All the nodes swell up like that. Um, right. Yes. No. Absolutely. And I was just thinking the immune lecture that I just posted, I go through all where most of the prominent lymph nodes are, which are familiar, right, for you guys? Okay. And then the, I mean, I'm not going to put a picture up of blood cells, but I thought just in case you need a visual of blood cells, what's different about, and what does this monocyte turn into? It's a big mama cell, isn't it? It's a big cell, okay? And those in tissues where we get like chronic inflammation, can actually join together with other macrophages and form this huge cell that will engulf substances. Okay, so the monocyte, I, you know, I don't really care if you learn what the other ones look like or not, but I mean, I care, but you know what I mean. So we know this, right? The whole rest, you know, ice, compression, elevation, right? Okay. Always inform your patient. What's important with ice to tell your patients? And and what off? <laughs> At least twenty minutes. I usually say yeah, on and off. Okay. You know in a book it says ten minutes. Yeah, that's because actually getting into fifteen minutes is sort of an iffy. You may have a hyperemic response. Okay. And then twenty, it's kind of boring. I say twenty as well. It it depends on where you read. Okay, whether you do. Well, I, I think the right thing in the book that's, says. that's right. And the book says, I really think, um, and this is kind of digging deep, and that maybe I'm getting old in my knowledge, but no, I think 20. 40 is getting up to the very bad situations. And I got to tell you, man, I practiced for 10 years. I still practice part time, just telling patients to get off the ice um, or using it properly has fixed 20% of my people because they think it feels good. First of all. Right? And they think, well, if this is a good thing, then a lot of it's a good thing. And, and what happens, let's just talk really quickly. If you put ice on there, if you put ice on an inflamed structure, it, initially it will constrict blood vessels, right, and decrease the inflammation in that area. But after 40 minutes, guess what starts to happen? Your body thinks it's going into hypothermia. And guess what the response to hypothermia is? opens up the blood vessels, they get this massive influx of swelling, right? And it causes um, pain. Okay, so you could kind of read through that on your own because we've touched upon most of it. Ch chronic and subacute and chronic, so it's really a time frame, subacute beyond one week, chronic is beyond six weeks. The chant, just a little side note from a clinical standing, um, if you have a patient who has some sort of musculoskeletal problem longer than six weeks, they have an 80% chance of that being permanently chronic. <laughs> it's really... It, because I, it took me years to go to the doctor for my back. Well, so and that's what already. I'm saying, because I know that you guys are physical, you know? So if you do have some sort of problem, don't let it go, okay? You should really have it taken care of, okay? And there are whole neurological reasons for that, scar tissue reasons, et cetera. Okay. Important agents for chronic inflammation. There's a whole list in your book. You know, some I just threw up there that should seem kind of familiar, right? TB, 
Um, don't see a ton of that anymore, thank goodness. Syphilis, and as thank you, late Lady Laura, and asbestos, okay, which hopefully we don't see a lot of that either anymore. But syphilis is on the rise again. Yes, and what population and, um, is it in on the rise in? Elderly. The elderly. Yeah, they're getting elderly they're people. Getting nasty in the nursing yeah, oh gosh, we're not going to put you on speaker. Okay, so. <laughs> Pathogenesis, okay, and I think I'm gonna zip through the, most of this, okay, macrophages are gonna to continue to, so neutrophils are gonna be the primary first line of defense, right, they're gonna come in, macrophages are gonna come in and clean that up. If that continues, so if you get tuberculosis and it embeds into your lung tissue and it stays there, because that's what it likes to do, you could get a granulomatous infection, okay. That can turn into caseous with TB, but that's just the first one that comes to mind with me. It, that cheesy stuff, right? But if we're not talking about that, we can get what's called granulation tissue. And granulation tissue is, is tissue that is not well made. Okay, fibers running every which way. It's granulation tissue is tissue that's not well made. There's going to be abnormal cells in it, abnormal placement of fibers, okay? And they'll be surrounded by a wall of tissue, okay? And what the body is trying to do is do what? trying to keep that infectious agent from spreading. spreading, okay? So here's a granuloma. Thank you, Lady Laura. Here's a granuloma. Where is this? What are we Vocal looking at cords. here? Vocal, Vocal cord is better known as the larynx, larynx okay? <laughs> so here's a granuloma. I don't know what caused this, but what is it going to cause? Could be pharyngitis, absolutely. What else could it cause? Maybe a change in their voice production, right? Could be a change in their voice production, absolutely. Okay. Are you saying chronic, chronic inflammation of, I know you only listed these, but any chronic inflammation is going to eventually cause granuloma? granuloma? No. No, this will be with an infectious agent, okay? So, so what pathogenesis means? Although, although, if there's a chronic irritant in an area, I imagine that could be a granuloma as well, but I do think this will seem, be seen more with an infectious agent like TB. A granuloma would be caused. So or asbestos. Get a granuloma from chronic back pain. Yeah. But you keep getting you, some people could get strep throat over and over again. I'm not sure what you're asking. I'm just wondering when you would, when, when, exactly when you would get, you? when there is a specific irritant to the body that stays in a specific location without being remitted. So if you inhale asbestos, if you get exposed to TB, um, I imagine if you got a parasite that died somewhere, your body would form this granuloma, this collection of dysfunctional tissue, and your body would actually wall it off and try to protect yourself from it. That's when you would get a granuloma. Okay. And there was another question. No, I, I was looking at pathogenesis. Pathogenesis then means the body's unable to mount a response against the... Oh, pathogenesis is going to be how that disease process of a granuloma is formed. Oh. So that's a generalized term that we can talk about over and over again. Sorry, pathogenesis. Does that clarify it? It relates only to a granuloma? No, you could have pathogenesis of many disease processes. This is the pathogenesis of a granuloma. And what so happens with this? Anytime the body is unable to amount a, resp a satisfactory response against a disease or a bacteria or a virus, then something else happens that was, cr was created, and that's the pathogenesis. But the pathogenesis is just the body's inability to make the response. If we are talking about, so this, we but can I don't talk. I what pathogenesis is. Pathogenesis is going to, so genesis is the creation of, I think we're talking about two separate things. Genesis is the creation of pathos disease process. So pathogenesis 
of any disease process is going to be how that disease process happens. So if we're talking about a granuloma, the pathogenesis of that granuloma is going to be... Oh, so it's... it's so it's, this is a generalized it's the process term. of how the disease... So we could talk about the pathogenesis of okay. you know, myocardial infarction. We could talk about that. That's a generalized term. And then you know, we're talking about could how be related that happens. To anything. So it's, Absolutely. it's not the it's not a failure no. of the body's response to mount to mount a satisfactory response. It's, well, it's the okay. process of how the body can how it handle becomes, that disease. Yeah, diseased. Yeah. Thank you. Good. You said that the granuloma cell or cells that aren't well made sounds to me like a granuloma has cells that aren't well no, made. No, when you were saying what it was, I oh. thought it were, you said that it was cells not well made. The, the tissue is not well made. So the tissue in a granuloma. Cell tissue. Well, well, it's going to be the tissue itself. So if we're talking about, suppose we take some sort of antigen and I stick it inside my skin. I go in for surgery and they leave a sponge in there, okay? Just to give you a more macroscopic visual, okay? This process will be the same as we, if we have some sort of infection that the body can't clear out. So that sponge is left in my skin. My body can't get rid of it. So what it will do is now my body can't make normal tissue around that sponge it's gonna form abnormal tissue around that sponge. It's not gonna be healthy, normal tissue. And then my body, since it can't get rid of it, will say, let's wall it off. Okay, okay let's wall it off because we can't deal with it. I know it's not good for me, but there'll still be inflammation around it, right? Because my body's still gonna keep trying. So if you can transpose that macroscopic structure into microscopic, if you have any sort of pathogen that you get into your body, so it is a normal response to something being in there that it doesn't like and wants to get rid of but can't. Well, yeah, but it's a it's, it's a, a it's a protection response. Absolutely. You want your body to do that. Absolutely. But it's abnormal to have it in there. Oh, sure. And then the tissue around it is abnormal. Okay. 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 Good. Any other questions about that? Right? Sarcoidosis, yeah, sarcoidosis, right? Sarcoidosis, sorry. Granulomatous disease that causes multiple non caseating granulomas that can affect multiple organs. Okay. Unknown etiology, probably linked to what type of grouping of uh, disease processes? I'm starting to get fried. Autoimmune, right? Autoimmune. Okay, and I think that there could be a link with this with other autoimmune diseases. I think crossover with RA, SLE, et cetera. Okay, so early, thank you, late Lady Laura, nodosum, they get these red patches on them. Okay, and then later progression, they can actually get, you could see that instead of having the red patches, they get more like a grainy kind of, not a grainy, more that granular kind of presentation, granulomas kind of, almost like a scar tissue, okay? So, and then the progression of this will just keep going, okay? It's kind of a sad little disease. Um, I've only ever heard that because my friend had it, but hers was in her lungs. Yeah, well, it can, it can form anywhere. Okay. The most superficial things that we'll see are the two that I gave you. But yeah, it can form... Let me see if I can, and you guys can pack up if you like. I don't think that I sh packed up any organ. Packed up. I'm so fried by the end of this. Three hours. I've actually lectured four hours today. Bless you. Do you know roughly when our, the test will be? We're in week two, week three, week four, week four will be the first one, and then week eight will be the last one. 
So you can see, let's see if we can see this. Full size image. Okay, I believe. So this would be the spleen, late Lady Laura. Okay. So the spleen is full of reticular tissue. It should look pretty uniform. Uniform. I'm so fried by the end of this. I'm so sorry. <laughs> uniform and full of blood. Okay. And what do we have here? That's going to be the granulomas tissue that's interspersed throughout there. Okay. Replacing the normal healthy tissue. So that's just one example. I'm sure there are plenty. Let me see if there's any other good ones. That's a great example. And there are those, what are called multinucleate giant cells, which are all those macrophages, which will sort of punch in together. Um, sure, your body can absolutely wall off one of these infections with calcium. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think that that would be early in the disease process. I think that would be later in the disease process. But calcium is also released as cells start to break down, right? Okay, so there'll be a little bit more of a uh, release of calcium into the interstitial tissues, right, that you can also use to sort of wall that off. And I would think, I would guess that it would be more predominant in some tissues other than others, that calcification maybe in the lung, I'm guessing, right? Yeah. Okay. Just curious, so. You know, why would... That's a normal, yeah, we could talk about it. So, all right, good. Oh, this is a long lecture, guys. Thanks for hanging in there. Any questions? No? Good. Okay, bye. We'll see you next week. Okay, bye. Let me go stop the tape.